Bushboat Allen closed down in December 2002. supported and we're absolutely delighted with the number of people who accepted the invitation to join us this afternoon. So what we felt we should do, as you've made the effort to come here, we should make the effort to make it a, a memorable afternoon for you. So we've set up a program. Uh, first of all I thought you'd like to have a quick look at the factory so that you can remember it um, as it was and as it is. We're going to take you around the site today. For many of you of course um, other than the site itself, which is now only that part, of course, many of you can remember the site going right back to what is the bypass. Nowadays, of course, we own just this section up the top end. So, a sad time um, for all the UK sites. Walthamstow, they decided to close, and we closed that last Christmas. Wickham and Melford were told on May the 2nd they were both closing. We, in fact, finished production in both the plants in September, both here and at Long Melford. We closed both the sites by December. So, a sad time for all of us. So the program is in a few moments, those who'd like to go around the site, we've got three people that will take you around on a tour and show you what the site is like today. Now we're already decommissioning the site, so what you'll see is some of the site is still running, some of it has been decommissioned and some of the plant has moved and that'll be explained to you as you go around. The factory has grown hugely from the time 60 years ago when the main task here was packing and processing fruit grown on local farms. Later, Bush Boak Allen took over and developed the factory to produce food flavorings and colorings. Over the years, these buildings have housed a range of equipment and machinery that was used to extract, concentrate, dry and process a vast range of raw materials. The finished products of factories like this one are used to colour and flavour many of the foods we eat every day. Hundreds of people have worked on this site over the years and today many of these past employees have returned to tour the factory for a last time before it closes down forever. Next thing 
It wasn't well, quite so big, no, it was, it was smaller than that. What was the firm called? Fruit Packers. Fruit Packers? Yes. We packed apples and pears. We had about 20, 20 to 30 farms all over Essex and Suffolk. We used to bring the fruit in here, store them. We had the big stores up the other end. And stores here, well, the Bontrade department is part of the, part of the store. Yeah. The apple packers were here, Whittam Apple Packing Station was here in the early 30s. Uh, I think I really got established towards the late 30s when the war was on. They had to have somewhere to store the, the products that were around here. And this was created. The, the site we're on now was only half used at that time by Bush Boat Allen had part of the land uh, when you come in the gate, uh, so it was a shared site in a way. It's always been a shared site. There's never been a fence between them. It was started in 1950. I came and had a look at the site in 1949, but I started work here in 1950, and there was only one building up then, that's all and they were processing apples, virtually apples at the start, and then went on to other fruits, raspberries, strawberries, black currants, you name them, and they were processing all those, and then extracting the juices and distilling flavours. And you virtually sold flavours more than anything else? That's right, yeah. Concentrated apple juice and uh, distillations of other fruits, and the pulp probably went to other factories, um, jam factories. And that's all the use they had in those days. Well, you get the lemons in, or oranges in car, in boxes, tip them on the conveyor, and it used to go through and they, they'd take all the zest off, which they used, and they also used the remains of the uh, lemon for the juices and that. There's now a warehouse, is it? No. Now just a pure storage warehouse now. Yeah. Uh, this used to be full up with stainless steel drums, drums and tanks and they would make the juices and extracts and you get a certain amount of juice and then half a ton of sugar and you come out with the syrups used in soda streams. They used to have a cooperage over there where they used to make their own barrels for the fruit juices when they uh, pressed them and packed them out, they used to go in barrels. Um, they started, I think, about 1952, 1953, processing fruit powders, and uh, there was a column in the local paper, the Rangeley Woodham Times, or the Rangeley Times, whatever it was called then, and um, people used to come to the door to, and that was in the paper itself, that they used to come to the door to find out what was being made up in the factory, in the town, they were, they were trying to assess what we were making eventually it went that they complain about the smells to try and get a rain reduction. <laughs> so it started off very nice at first but then it was um, trying to get a rate reduction. I suppose when we started processing cheese and flavours like that. Late 64, beginning of 65. It was at that time in late 65 they started to move out of Stratford and Ashgrove in London 
people's the environmental problems up there and the condition of where, where they were. They were they were actually underneath the arches in the railway arches at Stratford. So this was a prime place to come to, and in doing so, that is when they brought down the citrus products which were produced in Ashgrove. Uh, the colours were produced uh, in Stratford and some of the spray drying was produced in both. So what they did, they brought them to Whitton and joined them all up. Because we had a little spray dryer down here already. Uh, this BBA site that existed then really was only to process soft fruit and little bits of apple juice as well. But mainly the raspberries, the strawberries that were grown at that time in this area. The actual fruit was brought here and what, what we used to do was uh, press them. Uh, they had, if anybody knows what a press likes for the cider presses down in the West Country, the two presses were exactly the same here. It's just that we used cloths where they used more straw type things to crush the off pack. I came back from New Zealand in 68, it was about 70, I think 70, about 1971, something like that. And you came on site as site engineer? Site engineer. Actually, I was very, very lucky because I came for an interview and the first chap, I never got the job. And the first chap, after the first week, apparently dropped out. And they didn't know what to do. They didn't want to advertise again, so Mr. George Pohl, the manager in those days, he came knocking on my door and said, would you like to take that job? So I said, yes, all right. So I came here and my salary, my first month's salary was one, oh sorry, my first yearly salary was 1,500 pounds. What year would that have been? Must have been 70, 71, 72. It was 1,500 pounds, that was my first year's salary. And uh, I had workers working for me, they were earning as much with their overtime as what I was getting in the salary. And we were expected to work 44 hours a week, but we were only paid for 36. What about the plant that you had here at that time? What were well, you doing? We were trying to keep it going, and a lot of it was older than what I was. It was so ancient, it wasn't funny. But the biggest thing we had problem we used to, or I used to have, was finding spares. Because the equipment was obsolete, no one knew anything about it, and it was tracing through drawings, pamphlets. Who the hell made this? Where did it come from? Where can we get spares? The normal things, belts and uh, ball races, no problems, but it was especially bits and pieces. We had fruit presses that went back oh, to the year dot. They were so ancient it wasn't funny, but they used to, they were the old cider presses that the uh, apple makers had down the West Country. We had three of these. And uh, keeping those things going, that was a work of art. It really was a work of art. We, we did all the soft fruit here. I used to come in from as far as Scotland. Yeah. How many loads a day? I mean, it must have been, must have been seasonal. Yes, it was the soft fruit was seasonal. The apples were all the year round. Soft fruit was probably about in the middle of June, end of June. It used to come as far as Scotland. You used to have five lorries every day coming in from Scotland, it was round the clock. And uh, you, they employed just in the soft fruit probably about 30 to 40 people, mostly from I should say mid July to you know September. Mm -hmm. Students, mm -hmm. they would work yeah. Yeah. you know round the clock with the others. Most of the juices then were pasteurised, processed, mm -hmm. either const down to make them thicker mm -hmm. and that, and then dis dispatched to mm -hmm. various customers for different processes. Uh, we also did a slow, mm -hmm. a slow gin, which went mm -hmm. into. Uh, a bottle of slow gin that used to, Queen Mother used to have, and we had a crest, or they had a crest that was allowed. That was really all. The, it phased out gradually in mid to late 70s, the soft fruit. It was cheaper to buy the raw materials that were already processed. 
so it gradually disappeared and it's gone all together now. When I first had it one time, there were 25 of them working this one car. That's when you had the real crew, though, wasn't it? Yeah, 20. Those had all the real crew. It'd be 25 yeah. I was working yeah. there. Yeah. Favourite is what we call spray dry. Mm -hmm. What you do is you use a acacia gum base yeah. to hold the flavours to. And what, what it does then is in the spray drying process, you're spraying it down, holding it on there, and taking all the liquid away. So it's concentrating it up. It's in, in a way, it's it's the same as what the juices used to do. We yeah. used to take the water away, yeah. and you're, the only thing it's hung on to then. Yeah. It's got to have something to attach yeah. to as a gun, yeah, and gun. that way yeah. you, as I say, you bring it down 20, 30, 40 yeah. times. Yeah. If, if, if you're silly enough, you, you only have to touch a little bit on the tongue yeah. and it will burn. doesn't yeah. matter whether it's a mild one or not. <laughs> yeah. But if you'd have done the same in the pan, you'd yeah. have said, oh, it's, you know, it's quite nice, that black currant, that strawberry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you go for beef and that, you might not like them. but. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the gum is melted in them. These come off the tree like the sap from the, like the pine tree. That's, yeah. that's what they pick in Sudan. Yeah. But the, uh, this is melted and dissolved and then used as the main carrier for the flavours, which will hold the flavour, which is why the come out inside to the top. We've done this here. We melt it down in the new tanks. We cook it up. So, and we put it to a separator. Take all the rubbish out of it, store it in these tanks, ready for them to use into the tools of the barn. BBA's old colour department, which we used to make uh, non specs, which are made, which are colour, which was the main thing, which is this one, ruts, is uh, used for everything from confectionery to milk products to savouries to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, now, where, where did the colours come from, you know? Or you, know, you, you the buy them in? We do, they do a natural one and a synthetic colour. Synthetic colours are based on alkaline mixtures producing a yellow, a red or whatever. The coal mines and the anatos and that coal mines is a, a, a red, which is yeah. most people know that they put into the ice and sugar. That comes from a small beetle that uh, grows on cacti, usually in Peru and Mexico.
this is what we called an edge roll mill. What it did, it pressed the material. This area was the packing area where they used to do all the shipping cases and pack the colour, uh, what we manufactured, into little pots. And in the other area there, they used to have, uh, I think when I first came here, about 14 women, and they used to be there all day just packing uh, colour into little 500 gram pots. What are those colours? Are they um, soya? This is soya flour. We started. Um, 23 years ago, um, and it goes in the pot noodles. Uh, and what we do is just texture it, and that's the imitation pieces of meat. Raw material flour goes in here, like the bags were in there. Yeah. That's transferred right the way through a, to a process the other end, yeah. where it comes down, it's chopped up, and put into different sizes, like large pieces, small pieces, dust, and then it goes back, bagged up, and then it's Transferred. The whole process is in here run by two people. production would be about 60 tonne and when you think they put three grams in a pot it shows you how many pots they The area here is, is uh, what we classify as marble arch because it doesn't vary more than one degree summer or winter. Uh, why? It's because it's concrete top, concrete bottom. But because marble never varies in temperature, that's why they call it Marble Arch. You've got some funny names for certain yeah. places. <laughs> and the product in and there? The actual product is the finished product in bags, mostly 10 kilo in a bag. Uh, 
maximum 15. But these are the things that go in sausages, burgers. We lost the soft fruit but grew in the spray drying colours. Colours and the spray drying went hand in hand in a way because nobody was worried about the numbers in the days. They weren't worried about GMO, which is more prevalent now. They uh, went worldwide. We sent them for, uh, to nearly any country you can think of. And uh, the colours were big, really big into the Middle East. They liked that, the Far East, India and that, are massive in colour. Until they start to pro pre process and develop their own. <laughs> Going back to the earlier days, it was mostly spray drying fruit yeah. and a few other ones. Now you've gone on to nearly everything okay. there is from sort of mm. your fruit, to your boiled beef, to your mm. codfish, mm. Your, your whiskies, your, your ports, your brandies, mm. and anything that goes will spray. Mm. Extraordinary. And it's all coming to an end. And it's all coming to an end, yeah. sadly enough. Yeah. 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 It's, it's coming to an end on this side, it's well, alright, it's being moved to most of it's going into Tilburg in Holland, yeah. but some of the bits, the colours are being sold off, the soft fruit part is being yeah. disbanded altogether, yeah. the bond tray, yeah. is the, which is a soya protein, yeah. is being sold off, or is sold off now yeah. to an Israeli company. goes without saying, the reason we're doing these sort of things today and many other things we've got up to is we are convinced it's important when you're closing a factory to try and bring everybody together because we won't have the opportunity in the future just to say thank you but obviously to past employees today but we've been doing a number of things like this just to thank everybody for the tremendous effort they've been putting in to the business. Um, and then finally what I'd like to do as I've said there is to go through a, a few thank yous if I may. Uh, I think you'd all agree um, this has been an effort by Whitton. Everything you see here today has been the Whitton team. We talked about it, I asked the team would you like to do it and the team said sure we'd love to do it and as everybody on the site has been involved in one way or another. The painting, the lighting, the decorations, the support, everything you've seen around here has been a tremendous team effort. <laughs> Then what I'd like to do is again reiterate my thanks to the team. The team at Widham have been a credit to all of you as past employees. They really have excelled and we really have shown IFF what in fact they've lost by closing us down. We've given them superb performance, the quality's been top line and the attitude has staggered them. They thought we'd drop our heads, they thought we'd be depressed, they thought we'd be demotivated, they thought we'd be aggressive and we've turned the ta tables on them. We've been very buoyant, we've shown them what we can do, and we can all work, work out proud of saying we've done a blooming good job, follow that. So I'm really delighted with the team here, and I can't praise them enough for what they've done. They've been brilliant. And really, they couldn't have done it if you hadn't have set it up for them over the years. Because here today, there's people who come in with experience that goes back many, many years, and you set the foundations. So really, we have to thank you, first of all, for setting the foundations and making sure it's okay the people that are here today to finish it off for you. So from me and from all the team here, thanks for coming today. We've been delighted to see you. 
We do hope you enjoy the raffle, which is to finish this afternoon. And we do hope that we keep the contacts going, because it's been a superb day for all of us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.